right, good afternoon. Welcome to Cherry Beckert's GovCon podcast series. My name is Susan Moser. I'm the industry leader of the government contracts practice. And we'd like to welcome you to today's podcast. We get lots of questions about compensation and executive compensation in particular from government contractors. In fact, really, that's probably the most often asked questions are related to compensation. So today's podcast, we thought we would discuss an overview of some of the unique considerations for government contractors and talk about some of the commonly asked questions we get. So joining me today, I'm excited to have John Ford, who is a senior consultant in our government contracts practice. John has been with us at least a dozen years. Um, prior to that, he was with the government, um, DCAA as Deputy General Counsel and other uh, activities, and probably the person I have learned the most from over the last uh, over the last dozen years. In addition to John, also joining is Deb Walker. Deb is our Director of Comp and Benefits, and so basically deals with all things comp and benefits related um, for for many clients, not just government contractors, but she works with um, companies helping them. Uh, design and develop uh, various compensation plans and executive comp in particular. So let's get started. Um, first, I want to start with John, um, and I want to ask John, can you cover just some of the basics of where compensation is addressed in the FAR? Um, just talk a little bit about reasonableness and what are some of the current limitations regarding executive compensation? Uh, sure. <clears throat> let's uh, go back and address reasonableness to begin with. Uh, reasonableness, uh, there is a general reasonableness cost principle, which is found in FAR 31201-3, which applies to all cost that a contractor incurs. In other words, for a cost to be allowable, that, con that cost must be reasonable, and the criteria for determining reasonableness are determined in or listed there in 31201-3, uh, primarily, uh, the overarching test for reasonableness is that a cost in both its nature and amount cannot exceed what a prudent contractor would incur in a competitive business. Which is really but, clear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that gives contractors quite a bit of limitation, or not limitation, but leeway and latitude in regard to the costs that they incur, uh, particularly if they are in a competitive business. Because by definition, if they are in a competitive business and they are incurring a cost, uh, generally you would say, all right, uh, that cost must be reasonable because it meets that overarching criteria. But that's not necessarily the case. Uh, so uh, we'll that's a topic for another day and to get into all those issues about you know, what specifically constitutes reasonableness, but that is the overarching test. And that test applies to compensation. Now, the, in the FAR cost principles, compensation is addressed in 31205-6. And paragraph B of that uh, cost principle addresses reasonableness of compensation. And there are two sub paragraphs under B. One deals with compensation that is a result of a collective bargaining agreement. If that collective bargaining agreement was entered into at arm's length bargaining, uh, the costs are generally going to be considered, re that compensation is going to be considered reasonable. The second is comp sub paragraph under B, deals with compensation that is not the result of a collective bargaining agreement. And there are, and that subparagraph says that in addition to the test of reasonableness found in 31201-3, the compensation must be reasonable based on certain factors that, and that considered appropriate by the contracting officer and among those factors are going to be compensation practices of firms of the same size and the same industry and the same geographic location. 
uh, which are then those tests are generally the test that DCAA uses in determining reasonableness. DCAA usually does not consider the 312013 criteria in determining the reasonableness of compensation. Now, in regard to current limitations, <clears throat> there are dollar limitations and some administrative limitations that apply to allowability of compensation. For the administrative limitations, uh, the comp compensation must be serv for services rendered in the current uh, accounting period, and also that compensation cannot exceed that which is allowable for tax purposes. Now, for a dollar limitation, now there is a general limitation, that is an across the board limitation that applies to all employees. And that current limitation is $568,000. So uh, no contractors can pay employees more than $568,000, but $568,000 is the maximum amount that the government will reimburse a contractor for uh, a compensation that is subject to that cap. Now there are some, that cap doesn't apply to all compensation. It only applies to salary and wages, bonus, deferred compensation, and employer contributions to defined contribution pension plans. So if you have other types of compensation, uh, that cap does not apply to that compensation. But even if a contractor pays an employee below the cap, that compensation is still going to be subject to the tests for reasonableness that are found in 31201-3 and the cost compensation cost principle 31205-6. Okay, great. So I know um, another question that we get asked a lot um, is with regard to required disclosures that are flowed down in some subcontract agreements that uh, that require subcontractors to disclose information about the five most highly comped individuals. Can, can you explain how that works and, and who, who it applies to? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll try to. Yeah, this is a requirement that Congress laid on contractors. It applies to contractors and first tier subcontractors. And this is covered in a FAR clause, 52204-10. Uh, and as part of a contractor's uh, annual registration in SAM, uh, the contractor is supposed to report the names and total compensation of its five most highly compensated executives for its preceding completed fiscal year. And there are certain limitations on that. Uh, first of all, in the contractor's previous fiscal year, the contractor must have received 80% or more of his annual gross revenues from federal sources, not just con federal contracts. It can include contracts, grants, cooperative agreements, loans, subgrants, and any other form of federal financial assistance. So 80% of the contractor's revenue must come from those sources and the contractor must have received $25 million or more in annual gross revenues from federal sources. So both of those requirements must be met and the reporting has to be made in SAM if the public doesn't have access to the information about the compensation of its executives uh, through periodic reports such as those required to be reported by the SEC. So all three of those criteria have to be met before the contractor makes that uh, disclosure in SAM. 
Now the statute in the clause puts the burden on the prime contract door to get that same information from subcontractors and to report this information uh, in a government database, which is available to the public, just as the uh, there is also a database where the prime contractor has to report this information about its executives, which will make that information available to the public. Now, I noticed a couple of things about this reporting requirement. This applies to you know the compensation, even though it exceeds that compensation cap we talked about a minute ago. So what we're you know the government may not be reimbursing the contract door for uh, a substantial amount of the compensation that's going to be reported under this uh, particular clause 52204 10 uh, because you know there is no correlation or no reporting requirement to indicate what amount of the compensation is actually being charged to the government and the, the second point to be noted about this reporting requirement is that the compensate to compute the amount of comp compensation the executives are receiving, you have to consider almost all compensation that the contract that the employee receives, not just those elements of compensation that relate to the compensation cap, that $568,000 compensation cap. Okay. So it, it's a different reporting system and it's a different way of computing uh, compensation uh, under this clause than it is under the compensation cost principle. Okay, well, thank you for that because we that is a very confusing and I have to say irritating requirement for, for a lot of companies. Um, so let's switch gears a, a bit. Um, so I want to ask Deb about common executive comp plans. So I know you work with a number of a lot of our government contract clients to implement different types of plans. Um, can you just give us a little bit of an overview of, of the various types of plans, executive comp plans um, that you work with uh, government contractors on? Sure. Thank you, Susan. Um, I think the most common is uh, our option plans, and there are two kinds of option plans, incentive stock options, which have very favorable tax consequences for the recipients, um, meaning that you can get capital gains treatment um, for what would otherwise be compensation income, assuming holding periods are met, and then uh, non-qualified stock options. Incentive stock options are limited to those that vest at $100,000 dollars a year and therefore some people get both non-qualified and incentive stock options. The employer loses the deduction with respect to any amounts that's not recognized as compensation. So sometimes employers prefer non-qualified stock options and individuals also are subject to alternative minimum tax sometimes. If they're subject to alternative minimum tax, the incentive stock option can affect that tax calculation and therefore some individuals prefer non-qualified stock options. In addition to options, we have stock appreciation rights. A stock appreciation right is the right to future appreciation on the value of stock, but you don't have to pay an exercise price. It basically, whenever you want that future appreciation paid to you, you exercise your appreciation right and that appreciation will be paid to you. With a stock option, you have to pay an exercise price. The exercise price has to be equal to the fair market value of the stock on the date the option is granted. And some people don't like to pay exercise prices, and therefore you can have restricted stock granted or just outright stock grants. That's where the equity is transferred uh, immediately to the employee, and it's often subject to restrictions in that it will need to be returned if it um, does not vest, if the restrictions, usually they're time-based restrictions, you have to work three, four, five years, um, or performance-based, that certain events have to happen. 
uh, a liquidity event or uh, profits reach a certain level, sales reach a certain level. The restricted stock is interesting because it's, it's important that people understand they can either pay tax on the value of the stock when they get it or when the restrictions lapse. That's an individual choice made with what we call a Section 83B election. Election has to be made within 30 days after you get the stock, and there's no extension of that. So we run into a lot of um, startup companies where people issue equity, restricted equity, and um, the recipients don't realize they need to make an 83B election. Um, and so some of the tax benefits of having made that aren't realized by those people. Then to move away from equity compensation, uh, we also have deferred compensation. Deferred compensation can either be elective or non-elective. Um, it can be paid as what we would call phantom stock, the value of stock. So you have so many phantom shares and then they will be paid out at a specified time. Deferred compensation used to have a lot fewer rules than it does now. Now you have to make any election to defer your salary or bonus before the salary or bonus are earned. And the distribution period for those payments generally has to be fixed when the payments are either promised or the election is made to defer them. And those distribution periods can't be changed. So Congress was very annoyed that executives seemed to be able to defer compensation and get it whenever they wanted to. That was deemed to be unfair to people who are paid on salary and just have to take their salary whenever it's paid to them. So they've imposed restrictions on deferred comp. Um, and the biggest restriction is you need to state the payment date and then that date usually cannot, it can only be accelerated in very limited circumstances and can only be deferred in uh, limited circumstances. And it's the biggest problem we have with deferred comp is that people don't realize they have it uh, and then sometimes don't comply with the rule. But just to sum up, options, you have to pay for the equity stock, it's granted to you, don't forget if it's restricted to make an 83B election and then non-qualified deferred comp, which you wanna have somebody look to make sure that it complies with the rules of what we call 409 cap A. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Susan. All right, well, great, well, thank you. So I know that was a high level, but I we always, lots of companies are interested in, in looking, designing plans to obviously attract and retain their, their top, um, management. Um, and so it sounds like for a number of these plans, um, obviously you deal a lot on the, the tax and the structuring and, and making sure the employee or the recipient understands, you know, what their their tax situation is. So for some of these plans, the company is going to record um, some expense or some uh, ex can incur some expense at the time that they record these um, types of plans and, and others it would be, I guess, when when paid, is that is that a fair assessment? Well, usually the uh, gap recognition is over the vesting period. The tax recognition is when it's paid. So it's a little bit different for financial statement purpose than it is for tax. In general, yeah. tax, it's when it's paid. Okay. So, um, so, so those are good things to know. So John, um, you know, maybe just comment because again, um, you know, lots of companies and obviously we know how competitive the market is. And so lots of companies are interested in, in these types of plans. Um, so maybe just, you know, a couple of other comments on sort of the allowability of some of these types of, you know, executive, executive comp plans. Right, but most of these types of plans are addressed in the compensation cost principle. And going by a point that Deb was making about the tax consequences of some of these plans, as I mentioned to begin with, for compensation to be allowable under the FAR, uh, it has to be compensation that is recognized and acceptable or for tax purposes. So if you have a plan where the uh, is not going to be where the IRS is not going to recognize it or as a legitimate or a 
I shouldn't say legitimate, but as a plan that uh, can be claimed under the IR under the IS rules and the statutes, those costs are generally not going to be allowable. Now, a lot of these plant like specifically addressed in the FAR, like the you know, op stock option plans are generally going to be unallowable. The FAR makes unallowable uh, compensation that's based on changes in the value of stock. So if you're examining these uh, various types of plans and see if the compensation is based on uh, the changes in value of stock, it's generally got not going to be allowable. Uh, now, some of the types of plan in and that same thing about stock option plans, the same thing applies to phantom stock plans. Those are generally not going to be allowable. Deferred comp, that is a, a different issue. There is a specific uh, segment of the co compensation cost principle that deals with deferred compensation, and that brings in uh, CAS 415, Cost Accounting Standard 415, which deals with uh, deferred compensation. So you have to look to see uh, if the deferred comp plan meets the criteria of CAS 415 to determine whether that uh, deferred comp is going to be allowable or not. And let me just uh, address a, a couple of things. Uh, incentive comp plans. I know uh, that wasn't mentioned, but I'll just bring up one thing about incentive uh, comp plans uh, that where this comes into play sometimes is golden parachutes and golden handcuffs uh, after a merger and acquisition. Neither of those types of costs, golden cost of a golden parachute or the cost of golden handcuffs are allowable cost. So right. if you're if you're in the merger and acquisition market, just be careful about how you structure uh, that deal and any uh, arrangements you make with executives of the company that's being acquired. Great. So with that, um, you know, we, we obviously packed a lot into a short period of time and it's really meant to be a high level discussion of a complex area. Um, that we do get lots of questions about. And, you know, in working with companies and for companies considering various types of um, executive comp plans, um, it really is important to take into all aspects um, the considerations. You know, what objectives are you trying to solve or, or behavior are you trying to incentivize with a comp plan? What are the financial reporting um, ramifications? You know, how is it going to the, the gap uh, the financial statement. What are the tax considerations, both for the company um, and, as Deb, Deb mentioned, the employees? Um, it's important that everybody understands that. And then, lastly, important to government contractors in particular is is how is this all going to be handled from an allowability standpoint? So, uh, we hope this was a good overview for you. Um, if any of you are considering such plans or you have um, Further questions, we do generally approach these topics um, on a team uh, perspective because it is important to get the, again, the tax folks, um, Deb and, and her team um, to uh, to put this information together, uh, but then also to consider the, the financial reporting and then the government contract compliance. Um, so uh, we hope you enjoy this. We will be um, presenting additional uh, podcasts this year on other similar topics that our clients um, frequently ask, ask us about. Um, you can find out more on our schedule uh, by looking at our website, cherrybeckert.com, um, and you can follow, um, follow our GovCon podcast series. So thank you.